Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Andy's Witchcraft by me, Sacred Moon. I hope you're all having a wonderful day so far. Today's episode, we have another guest appearing on the show, and she's going to talk about witchy parenting, and more specifically, witchy homeschooling tips for all you homeschooling parents out there. Uh, I'm really excited for this. I don't have kids myself, but I hope to one day. I hope to raise them with a witchy upbringing, obviously, to teach them more about my own spiritual path. Um, And so I'm hoping that this interview will help gain some insights into that and help all you current parents, future parents, whatever. Um, Even people who don't plan to be parents. This might just be interesting knowledge. Um, And so, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode and let's get to it. So thanks again for coming on the show, Mimi. I really appreciate that. Um, If you want, you can give a brief introduction on who you are and kind of like what brings you here um, before we jump into the nitty gritty of the episode. Absolutely. Hi, I'm Mimi, and I go by the Feral Southern Housewife. I'm on TikTok and YouTube, and I have a blog that I'm writing, slowly but surely, and I also have a podcast, and it's all kind of all about that everyday witchy stuff, um, homeschool and witchy stuff, and like just some granny magic that's been kind of swept under the rug. I just kind of want to bring it all back out to the surface, you know? So that's that's just kind of how it is. Yeah, for sure, and that's very cool. And then I will be linking um, any all of that in the caption below. Um, yeah, so we, everyone else can access your blog and podcast and all of that stuff. Oh, cool. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right. So now that we're getting started, I just want, I uh, was hoping you could tell us a bit more about your journey to witchcraft, kind of where you came and maybe a little bit about like, deconstructing or whatever you're comfortable sharing with well now see that's the surprising part about doing Appalachian folk magic and doing granny witch and stuff is that um, the deconstruction was kind of already started all the things that you do is it, it has this like air of magic around it anyway a lot of the superstitions and a lot of just like the basic ritual of the day like saying hello to your house and goodbye to your house um when you come and go and the way you pray and you know a lot of the church ritual was very uh it it always had a mystic feeling to me but uh that was uh pentecostal so that's lots of big hooting and hollering and laying on hands and lots of energy work as it were so it it always felt real mystical to me I started deconstructing at a very young age because I just could not wrap my head around how, if we were made in the image of God, why did he know how to make women? It boggled my mind. And (laughs) we know now that a lot of my precociousness as a child is because I am autistic and that black and white thinking had me doing a lot of questions in the church. (laughs) And uh, basically, it's just been there my whole life. It's it's always been in like the books that I've read, the shows that I watched, even when my parents were like, Oh, this is going to be of the devil because you know, satanic panic was huge in the nineties, especially like around the Harry Potter and stuff, but I still read the books. It's fine. (laughs) But I mean, you can't tell me that, you know, these things are of Satan and turn around and do the exact same thing and slap God's name on it. You know? So I was always, (laughs) I was always questioning and always just like, Ooh, this, this feels spooky witchy to me, so I'm just gonna. I always, I was always like the princess witch, and I remember telling my mom one time who was prayed over me, he's like, Lord, why? Why does she keep saying she's a witch? And I'm like, because I'm like Glinda the Good Witch. I just want to do nice things. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, so that sounded like it started like really young for you. Um, so, who was it that really introduced you to um, Appalachian folk magic? Um, that was my little memo and just a little bit with, it was so integrated into so much of our day, you know, and so much of our day to day. Like, um, there was one where if our feet were hurting, we'd flip our shoes over so that whatever energy we carried around in our shoes would leave. So our feet would stop hurting. You know, if the broom fell, we knew somebody was coming over. 
or you know we did a lot of stuff with brooms like uh we flipped it up so the bristles were right side up to make people leave if we didn't want them there anymore kind of a thing a lot of uh what we did with our food you know like we'd always pray over the food and bread was always seen as like the body of christ you know mm -hmm. so everything everything had some kind of magic attached to it and i know it's not considered magic if you're in the church but you can't tell me that's not what it is <laughs> so it's Absolutely. just it's just always been there you know it's even in how i pray and how i was taught to pray like raised to be praying it was this earnest shaking kind of a full intention whole body experience in praying you know you get, I keep looking back and thinking back and seeing the stories that little memo told me and then being around the people in the church. And I'm just like, how, how is this not which <laughs> How is it? How is it not? But yeah, just the little things she taught. Now she died when I was really young. I think I was about eight when she died. Mm -hmm. So I only had like a little bit of time with her, but even in that little bit of time, she was still just like, mm, keep asking questions. You're asking the right questions. And I'm like, yeah, all right. Okay. No, that's really great that you got that encouragement. That makes me very happy. Um, and it kind of, you know, it can make bringing on to like the next few topics we'll talk about when we go more into like the parenting and homeschooling stuff. But it sounded like, you know, she was kind of like that uh, one of the many parental figures you had in your life. So she was a, a role model in how to teach, you know, your your kids, um, the witchy traditions and all that. That's really great to hear you had like a pretty stable start when it came to that. Yep. If And before she died, she gave my mama a box of Foxfire stories, like two or three of the books. And that was basically just kind of a... They realized that a lot of the young folk back, I want to say in the 70s and 80s, realized that they were losing a lot of their culture by people growing up and moving out and stuff. So they went around to the elders in the towns in their community and were just like tell us your story, tell us what you know. And giving us that gave us another like look into all these little superstitions and the little, the little witchy stuff and reading nature signs and being one with nature. A lot of it was under the guise of being a steward of the earth for God, but it was literally just energy work with the earth. And I was like, how? <laughs> <laughs> oh, for sure. Oh, that, that's really great. That makes me actually so happy to hear. <laughs> it's there. If you go looking, if you know where to look, it's there. So that's awesome. always a good part. Yeah, for sure. No, I agree 100%. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, now that we'll kind of like move on, uh, unless there's anything you wanted to add to like that first question. Uh, nope, I'll probably just end up babbling about it later on in one of the questions. It's fine. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Um, and so, you know, when I when I reached out to you to ask if you wanted to be on the podcast and ask what topic you wanted to talk about, I thought witchy homeschooling sounded really cool. Um, and so if, if you could just describe to us what witchy homeschooling is to you and to your kids, um, give us that background. Oh, yeah. So because so much of what we do is just in every day that we live, I also kind of homeschool that same way. I've always just figured we needed to teach our kids stuff at home. Even though I was working, you know, the weekends we had, it was, all right, now let's go learn how to do this or let's go discover something else here. And witchy homeschooling is kind of the same. There's a big, there's a big thing about homeschoolers being weird and super religious and Christian. And that's, that's not far from the truth. There are a lot that are like that. But there's a, a bigger rise in like secular homeschooling and things like that. So we have more options for how we want to teach our kids now. And um, the big reason why I do witchy homeschooling is just to kind of foster that belief of how we are connected to the earth and the things around us, as well as like a lot of emotional intelligence that I feel like gets left behind in childhood, you know, being there and present for your kids, um, trying to give them the skills they need and that connection they need to be able to feel independent enough that they can go off and, and grow as they should. And uh, to me, 
when I'm putting that into my homeschooling, it's basically taken that place of the Christian theology and the Bible study and stuff like that that so many homeschool curriculums have baked in, you know? So to me, it's not so much of like how we're lit, you know, the how we're living, you know, the, the holidays and the little traditions that we have, but the why behind it. So, you know, you've got your Bible study, you've got like, oh, we read this story around Christmas time because that's just what they do. And to me, it's we have the story for this one. And like we just did Michaelmas, which is like the Feast of the Angels. And it, the synchronicity between that and the autumnal equinox is huge because it talks about Michael teaching the people to harvest the grain to make bread to share with one another to defeat the dragon of like sadness and ruin and stuff like that hmm. and i feel like if we take the fairy tales and the folk stories and we view it from a lens of like this is how our great grandparents and before that all learned you know that's how they did school and that's how they learned how to live in this world and why can't we why does it have to be something stuck in the ideals of, you know, the one God and Jesus and all the apostles? Why can't it explore the very tenets of the culture that we came from? You know, whether it's Appalachian folklore or whether it's, you know, Irish stories, Celtic stories, things like that. Why can't we have that instead of the Bible stories? You know, I feel like as my kids will get older, they'll realize that there is so much uh, magic that science is proving. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Yeah, no, for sure. I, it definitely makes sense, especially with like the connecting to nature like that. You know, you're bringing in the, the magic with the natural sciences, which is really crucial, honestly, to teach you not only to think things rationally but to also trust your intuition like there has to be a balance you can't be 100 percent rational and you can't be 100 percent um intuitive because that can cause you to be naive or anything like that um and so it, re it really sounds like you're creating that balance between the two which is absolutely great yep and also like from the newest aspect of it, because my kids are going to be living in that climate crisis. You know, if I had realized just how bad it was going to be back then, <laughs> I would have been a little more prepared with having kids. But I want them to realize that they're just they're not just, you know, it's not woo woo fluffy. It's it's part of who we are is to be able to take care of this earth and why and like the res and building that respect for what we have around us in nature and not letting, you know, learning from the past, but not letting it go completely. That's a huge one for us, too. Yeah, no, that's great, honestly. Yeah, it's important to really, you know, you have to think about the history as painful as it can be. Like, it's good to know about it. So we know what we want to avoid, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's great that you're teaching your kids that. Um, and the question that just kind of popped to my mind, like, as you were talking about this, um, so uh, I'm not 100% sure how homeschooling works. I wasn't homeschooled personally. I don't really know personally anyone who was homeschooled, but I assume there is some like structured curriculum that is necessary to teach to make sure that kids are um, at the same level as kids who are in like the public and private schools and all that. And so how do you balance the your desire to, you know, have that witchy aspect but also keep with the curriculum that's put in place by the government and whatnot. So the biggest thing is that I took into consideration when I started my homeschooling journey with my girls was that there is no ahead or behind. My kids are where they are supposed to be. We are a neurodivergent household. I have one kiddo that is fully diagnosed with autism, ADHD, dyspraxia, and uh, PDA. And she also has um, just a lot of emotional growth that she needs to get through. There's a lot of uh, inhibited emotional understanding. And then my older two are showing every single red flag of ADHD that you can have. 
And I'm like, all right, well, whenever we can, because trying to get the diagnosis is almost as hard as getting the treatment after, you know? Mm -hmm. So getting all of that in, I had to kind of throw out the idea of having public school at home. And in doing that, I was able to take a step back and be like, okay, how do I make this as informational as possible without making them feel like all they're learning is, you know, Disney movies and whatever it is. You know, it's it's my job to bring them things that will hopefully spark that curiosity and then follow them down whatever rabbit hole they want to go so they can learn. Um, so, like, for example... Um, my oldest has been in public school almost the whole time. She homeschooled during COVID and then wanted to go back to public school. But even when we were home, she would, we would do little projects together and, and movies and we would deep dive into things all the time. And because of that, she has an innate love of like Russian history and literature. What 15 year old do you know that loves Russian history and <laughs> literature and art and just and has decided that she's not going to follow the traditional path she's going to be an animator and graphic designer most kids are just like i you know that they have very basic of like i just want to be x y and z because this is what i see around me but you know she sees the other possibilities and is like well this is what i want to do so then for izzy who is nine her thing has always been like makeup and you know pretty princessy things so we deep dove into um like english princesses french princesses italian princesses things like that through history kind of as a backdrop for the fairy tales that we were learning so like this is how they would eat this is how they would dress this was the etiquette then and this is the etiquette now and this is what we learned now and like what was the difference and she's just gobbled it up right Mm -hmm. so and her big thing is she wants to do makeup so she's trying to figure out how to make her own makeup well guess what that's chemistry girl mm -hmm. you go on <laughs> she is nine and trying to teach herself chemistry so she can make her own makeup okay sure and then my five-year-old miss maggie she's the one um her big things are she loves pokemon but she also loves outer space so she is really getting into like I don't remember what it's called when you want to take care of a bunch of animals. It's not like a zookeeper. It's not that. It's like There's a specific word for it, and I'm not going to remember it now, but she kind of just wants to have a farm and raise a bunch of animals and take care of everything. It just Or be a vet. She wants to take care of them and make them all better again. But Pokemon helps her with that because then she understands how some animals need to be treated a certain way. You have to make sure they're taken care of. The, she's really fascinated by breeding them with dittos to see what kind of Pokemon she can make. So that's pretty cool. Look at there. She's learning biology. And we apply that to different things. Um, so when the seasons change, we watch the animals out here. We've had a bunch of deer. So guess what we learned? We learned about, you know, why the deer um, go in big groups out here and why they do what they do and how that compares to Pokemon. I don't know how we make it happen, but it makes sense in her head when we understand when we do things and now that's the basic parts um when it comes to witchy stuff you can modify a curriculum or the unschooling the child-led in a way that says um uh, I'll, I'll use izzy for an example again her she loves to collect rocks and she has always loved to collect rocks that's been a thing that she's done her and her papa have done that for as long as we can remember and so I'm like, okay, well, let's teach you the basic, like, five, first five basic crystals for every little, you know, witchy girl to know. So we talked about quartz. How is it made? You know, we talked about the geology behind it. What is it used for in magic and what is it used for in everyday life? And then we went on a deep dive in, like, how quartz is used in, like, watches and phones and stuff like that. And, and Miss Maggie, you know, she loves astrology. Or not astrology, but she loves, like, planets and things like that. So we started learning about, like, the moon phases and a little bit of, like, oh, which planet is Venus? And what is Venus in charge of? Loving others and yourself. And what is Mercury in charge of? Making sure we can talk, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's little things like that where it's not just a matter of, oh, they can just figure it out or oh they're only learning. It's, it's not like in the beginning of Practical Magic where Aunt Jet says, 
come on, we're going to learn something that school will never teach you. And just, who cares about homework? Is that, no, we care about that stuff here. <laughs> we just do it different, you know? Um, in spite of the fact that there are a lot of not so happy connotations and backgrounds to Rudolf Steiner's work uh, that built Waldorf schooling, we take a lot of the elements from that. So like teaching from fairy tales and folklore, teaching from, you know, looking at other cultures through a uh, philosophical and uh, sociological lens, lens, can't speak. You know, we look at all these things as part of like history and literature and culture of the world and move it all together. So it, it, we kind of have to take a step back and be like, okay, these were things that they believed back then. And unfortunately, it was very prevalent and it was not good for how we want to be now. So I have to take a lot of the older stuff and tweak it to make sure that um, none of the racism or misogyny kind of seeps into what we're trying to do now. So the kids aren't trying to double back and be like, oh, sorry, this is how I was taught, you know, like I was when I was younger. And it's very much going forward that things are equal. Everyone is equal to them you know, love your neighbor, and they very much have that already in a lot of what they do, so a lot of the, yeah, basically, it's it's just a matter of, like, kn knowing your kid, <laughs> <laughs> and the first, the first year I went full force into it, and not just part-time, it was so hard, I had to relearn everything, mm -hmm. we didn't do school proper, because every time I tried to force school like I made school, you know, public school at home, it just killed any will to like learn or do anything. So I was like, all right, we're going to start from the ground up and we're going to do this a different way. And doing that actually helped a lot more than any other curriculum I had or anything like that. So I feel pretty happy about where we are now, but yeah, it's, there's definitely a place to do it, a time to do it. You can use all kinds of things like, um, like I mentioned, Waldorf inspired school. I meant, um, as far as curriculum goes, you can make your own if you really want to. Um, there's a few groups on Facebook for pagan homeschoolers and pagan parents that talk about, um, a few people have like little witchy, um, worksheets and stuff for like the solstices and stuff. And it's really cute. And, um, there's a TikToker that I follow and I absolutely love her stuff. She's a lot of self-reliant, uh, information, but she also does some, more spiritual sided uh, stuff for her homeschooling. So seeing what she's doing is like inspirational for little things I want to add to what we have. And being able to move forward, you don't have to have uh, a witchy, spooky homeschooling stuff. You can have secular. You can even take a Christian one and tweak it and throw some of the Bible stuff out. But mm -hmm. it's about how you approach your kids with the information you have. You don't have to be brilliant, but you do have to be honest. And you have to be present. And and I would say even earnest in how you approach things. It's it's definitely, it's put me in a different mindset in the last couple of years. I want to say in the last three, four years, it's definitely put me in a different mindset than originally when I wanted to start homeschooling to begin with. So, Yeah, I was just listening this the whole entire time with like amazement because that... <laughs> No, you know, a lot of people don't think to to tweak, you know, school to the needs of the child. And I'm like all for that, you know, like I hate when schools act like all the kids in the classroom have to learn the same way, like listening to a lecture and then writing a test on it. Like that's not how all kids learn. Like, no. uh, and so I, I really admire that you acknowledge that you like you like you said you first brought in public school to the homeschool and you were like okay this isn't working what can I do to improve and you thought about that you did the research which is really important and I think it's something every teacher regardless if they're homeschool or public school or private school is something every teacher should do honestly oh yeah and that was the other part of it I could I, I saw myself as a parent wanting to meet my child, but I also had to remember that I am a teacher. So how am I going to make this fun and lead them to where their curiosity can take off? That was a different hat to put on for sure. Yeah, no, and that yeah, exactly. Like you said, took the words out of my mouth. Balancing, like they know you as mom, they don't know you as Mrs. Mimi, right? Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> teaching them, okay, this is school time. I'm not your mom. I'm your teacher right now. 
I'll be mom after. But of course, like, you know, parents, you know, obviously sometimes you do have to take a pause from homeschooling. Like if your child is in distress, you know, it's important to take a pause and be like, okay, let's talk about this. Then we'll go back to a regular scheduled school. Um, but, you know, to teach them that like there's a time for teacher and there's a time for mom. So, oh, yeah, yeah, it was really and <laughs> I was going to say another thing I, I realized is even meeting them like on a witchy level or like on a neurodivergent level. It was literally, you know, you were saying, you know, we'll we'll come back to all this afterwards. There are times when I sit there and go, you know what? Maybe we just don't need school today. And I try again on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. Or we try to school, you know, homeschool pretty much year round. So. Oh, yeah. No, there you our, go. Our stuff really picks up. Autumn equinox, that's when we have our first festival week, and then we get really into our lessons, and we go until June 21st. We go into the summer equinox so that she has literally the summer, and I think that's actually been a lot more helpful because, you know, it's in the beginning of September, at least up here, it's still nice enough to want to go do things, and then all the kids go back to school so we can, like, go to the museum by ourselves without having a sensory meltdown because everybody's running around screeching mm -hmm. and hollering, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's great for sure. I applaud you. Like that's, that's really wonderful to hear. Um, and so my next question involves kind of like the media, um, which, you know, like I feel like especially if they're being homeschooled, you can monitor it a lot more than, you know, if your child is out at public school. Um, but in the media, you know, like witches are seen as negative or evil. Um, and so... Um, especially within like Christianity, right? Like the traditional Christianity, which I I know you're not like you're, you know, you're not uh, fully like the traditional, but like you were raised, like you said, with your mom question, like, why is she a witch? This is evil. Yeah. Um, and so kids can often get exposed to that, right? Um, and so like, yeah. how do you explain what witchcraft really is to your kids versus that's just what they show on TV, like, for fun or whatever like how like how would you explain that so when they're younger like five and under I don't outright tell them hey mommy's a witch by the way it <laughs> <laughs> but half of it's to protect them but also because of the society we live in right now even though I am free to practice how I wish uh there are still people who would wish harm <laughs> so Little kids have no filter, period. And so when they're just like, yeah, my mom's a witch today. And you're just like, shut up. And so I don't really bring that out. Um, what I do around them doesn't seem, quote unquote, witchy to them. You know, I have my altar space in the, ha you know, in the living room, actually. And it has like a traditional like a Sator square. It's got my candles that have the faces of Jesus. And, you know, there's the... Uh, uh, an angel and then there's one with like mother mary and then mary magdalene like they see these faces and they're like oh these are from you know when as they get older when they ask for bible stories i will tell them but um they're like oh okay well this is just mom praying and i want to pray too so this is cool we can do this and they don't really see it as witchy when i make my simmer prot they just think oh mom is making it smell good oh this is what it feels you know this feels nice or if we're baking something together and then it's like, oh, this is going to taste delicious and I'm enjoying my time here. Whereas I'm folding in like contentment and joy in my ingredients so that when we eat it, it's like, yes, bring those memories back. Bring that happy memory back and let it stick in your head. So mm. I feel like, um, oh, there is some media, you know, my nine-year-old Izzy, she is, uh, she has a little bit more leniency and her thing has basically been, I want to watch all the witchy shows. And I'm like, well... <laughs> you know what that's fine so like there was just add magic on prime which is adorable and it's very kitchen witchy with a little bit of like mystery involved it's definitely for like 9 to 12 it's adorable um and kiki's delivery service who doesn't love that you know the yeah. studio ghibli stuff and then um let's just little stuff like that i i don't let them necessarily see like Sabrina or the craft or stuff like that. that's not that's not their level you know so yeah I do watch what they have 
But even some of the younger stuff, you know, you see the witches for Halloween, you know, they're all haggard and old and stuff. And when the question comes up, Mom, why aren't you old? Why don't you look ugly? Because you're a <laughs> witch. It's like, well, honey, because I'm not old enough yet to look like that. That's what that is. I don't live in a swamp, so I'm not green. You know, it's, it's <laughs> me tongue in cheek, obviously. But what I tell them is that, and it's, it's true of many things. You know, the, the point of witch being a mistranslation into poisoner or someone who harms on purpose out of spite or cruelty. And I tried to explain it to Izzy that the reason I do not look like that is because what I do is not purposefully hurting people. So my ugly feelings on the inside don't show on the outside as green skin and, and awful things. There's also a lot of like the hooked nose and some of the other things that they have is blatantly anti-Semitic and a lot of the witchy stuff too. So I'm trying to steer away from that aspect that they see. Obviously I can't, you know, keep them from everything, but I try to show them that people who are witches aren't like that. And as they get older and start asking questions, I can answer it better. But essentially they they just know that it's it's the way that we do things it's the traditions it's the recipes it's just how we celebrate our holidays they don't really know the negative that's behind a witch in media now yeah no that makes a lot of sense to me especially you know with like you know if kids don't need to know like the label witch you know at least describe to them what you're doing rather than just stick on that that label that they may or may not understand. Um, so it sounds like, you know, you're taking it based on their age and based on their level of understanding that they have, right? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so like you're not going to run into like situation where like you have to explain something, you know, they might not have that cognitive capacity to like really like understand it may leave them more confused than um than they originally started so that is that makes a lot of sense to me and that's you know and it's really good that I love your explanation of like oh I don't live in the swamp <laughs> that's why my yeah <laughs> not green. I love that <laughs> well you know I can be silly about it because it's you know especially when you see more of the negative like actual negative mean kind of things um i'm trying to think of like the witches from the worst witch the 80s movie we watch that every year around halloween and seeing the more evil wicked heckled cackling witches you see that they look horrendous and it's like why don't you look like that and i'm like well do i act like that no (laughs) so Witches here are meant to make it scary and it's meant to make it look bad for what we're doing when what we're doing is not bad. And it, it's just as simple as that. Just that's, that's all it is. You know, kids understand the most simple explanation. You don't have to go above and beyond until they're like, I want to say 15 is probably when I started really discussing more theological aspects of it with my oldest. And she's just like, yeah, whatever. Love you, mom. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, totally. I definitely, yeah, I definitely get that. (laughs) Um, And so, you know, now we're going to move on to questions evolving kind of like outside of that homeschooling aspect and more of like the mom that happens 24-7. And so in your daily parenting practice, how is it that you incorporate witchcraft into that? So a lot of it, I had already talked about, you know, we read, we know the stories, how we cook together, the certain things we do around holidays and traditions. To add more witchy stuff, um, I will, like, look back to the idea of, like, the way things are set up around a lot of the Waldorf homeschooling stuff. So, like, their days, you know, and, and when they start, like, in six, seven years old, they start, like, the color of the day. Um <clears throat> the planet, the stone, and things like that are already there. And I'm like, oh, this is witchy as hell. (laughs) So I kind of already start that. So, you know, they know when they get upset or anything, they can come to me and I'll introduce them that way. So mommy is making them feel better. But also, look, I have a black rock that I can hold on to when I feel upset. And that will help me to feel better. Um, I can 
say my affirmations and my mantras. I can sit and be mindful and, and let my body calm down. It's like half spicy psychology, half sensory diet needs, and that it just looks very witchy to a lot of people. So keeping that going, I don't force it on them. If they don't want to, they don't have to. You know, if they don't want, if they want to do something else to make themselves like feel better or to learn, they can do that. But it's so much of it, you know, once again, is, is baked into our own like ways of doing things. So my kids don't know any different from like the way I decorate the house, how I do my prayers around the house, or, you know, they, they don't they don't question it because it doesn't seem weird. So the little things really, it's just, it's that whole being present and being mindful thing. You know, your best intention is set and laid in the foundation of knowing where you are and knowing what needs to be done in the situation. Yeah. And so you teach your kids how to go about things and how to, bring all of the things around you in. So like when the seasons change or how the moon has their cycle and things like that, every little thing we do has that flux, that, that rhythm, that, that flow of things. And so as the parent and the guardian and the one protecting them and the one educating them, it all is just one big mod podge of this is what I do now that being said I don't necessarily do full-on spell work when my kids are around me I usually wait until everybody's asleep and a lot of that's because I don't want somebody messing with all my stuff while I'm doing <laughs> these spells I don't have a lot to my spell work but being able to focus on my attention and really pour myself into it is very helpful to the spell itself and having you know my two-year-old right now she's still nursing off and on so having somebody attached to the boob while I'm trying to cast the spell and pray with Archangel Michael is not helping like at all like no you, you just go to bed go to bed and I'll do this later same thing goes for like divination my girls love my tarot cards they think they're so pretty but they know there's two decks they're not allowed to touch they know that when mama has her candles lit and is sitting at the big table and has her cards ready, we don't touch any of that. And if they want to, they can ask me questions and we can pull little cards. And they're like, oh, that's cool. That's the card for the day. The card for the day is a rabbit running around a tree or something. I don't know. But they don't necessarily have to put all that into, you know, put all of that witchy stuff into it. They just see how I live, you know. The other side of it's like the crocheting, you know, having a craft to do, literally a craft to do. So like one girl likes to sing and she pours herself into her songs. Well, guess what? She's technically doing spell work and energy work with her songs, with her feelings. So we do a lot of like almost spicy psychology with that one where if she's really upset about something, she can turn it into a song and then sing it whenever she's really upset if she can't find the words to tell me and I can just listen through the wall at her singing so that she feels better, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, or, you know, we can light a big candle, we can have a big prayer and a big snuggle on the couch and have that moment of connectedness and have that little extra feeling of, ooh, this is extra special because we're also talking to, you know, God or something like that. And it's literally just, it's, it's just, it's just every day. It's literally just every day. Witchy parenting is just like regular parenting. Okay. Everybody has just that little bit of something in, that they do, whether it's how they decorate their house or how they protect their house or, you know, the routines for how they cook or what they cook. You can be a natural granola mom. You can be a scrunchy, silky, synthetic mom or whatever they call them. And, you can be everywhere in between, but it's literally just the intention of what you're setting with, with your kids while you are going about teaching them how to be humans. Uh, yeah, like all of that, my, my favorite part about that response, I'm going to say, is the balance between the gentle parenting, but also establishing boundaries, 
rigid boundaries with your kids like you know don't touch this you know my this is my space please respect my space like a lot of people think that gentle parenting is letting your kids push you around which is absolutely false um and you really display that like you're like gentle empath uh, empathetic empathic whatever the word is but at the same time you know being kind to yourself and recognizing you have the right to your space and your property and you have to teach your kids that right yeah um, like i i show them that respect to their things you know i ask you are we ready to do this can i touch this can i move your things here we also you know we have that aspect to it of like this is definitely mine we do share as much as we can obviously my kids can just about ask or see or look at anything that they want to but they have to definitely touch and i still have the right to say no because you know these things are sacred or special to me so that balance of we can share without taking over is definitely a bigger part and definitely an underlying bigger part to what I'm trying to teach them through all of it. Yeah. Sorry, just give me one second. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, just the casual disruptions. You get that as a mom. <laughs> all the time. Um, but uh, yeah, okay. So going forward with that, like, I, I also love how you said, you know, you don't force it. Um, you know, you let your kids, um, you know, when they want to be witchy or learn witchy things, you let it, but you don't like push your beliefs on them essentially, which is really, you know, important. Um, but, you know, are there any witchy practices that your kids enjoy? And like, if so, like, what are they? <laughs> so we do just in general, um, Let's see. So my oldest actually doesn't necessarily have uh, a thing that she does. She is really, she says that she's agnostic and she wants to abstain from spirituality or anything like that. But she still loves her zodiac signs and she loves uh, the shiny rock. So I'm just like, you know what? You find whatever makes you comfortable. You'll find that balance and you'll just enjoy what you enjoy. You know, I'm not going to say it has to have anything underneath it um but izzy the one who's trying to teach herself chemistry from makeup <laughs> we do a lot of color magic with her and a lot of what we're doing um i would say almost glamour magic but it's not to cover anything up or hide anything to her it's to help bring out that confidence when she was little and when we had 4k and 4k with her was when i knew we're homeschooling for good um she was uh she went to school and her favorite thing to do was to put her makeup on before she went to school and she had kids like you don't have to wear that why are you wearing that and I was like you know what you tell them you tell them I wear this because it feels good to me and I like how I look with it and they left her alone after a little bit and, and nobody questioned anymore so she's been like the only kid to wear full face makeup I mean and I face say full face like she put on blush and eyeshadow and lipstick and that's about it mm -hmm. but like it w and nails painted, hair done every day. She picks out her outfit meticulously the night before. That's how she has been since she was like two. So I'm not going to stifle that. But I'm, you know, when she wants to learn more, I definitely want to boost that confidence and like protect her energy. So we learn about some color magics and just some things we can do to help with that. And of course, you know, she loves her crystals and all her rocks and minerals, she says. So she is definitely she she's a big crystal girly so we're just gonna she I, i'm making her a little um a little macrame necklace that she can carry one of her stones in so she can change it out and learn about which one's gonna make her feel better what it's gonna do what kind of things it's gonna do to protect or uh exude her energy you know that's as she gets older we can get into the finer points of it but for right now she just needs to know that if she's feeling kind of down about herself and wants to little pick me up like you know, she's disappointed she didn't get to hang out with her friends. She can have some blue to help her calm down or some red or her signature color, which is pink, and it'll make it feel better. And this is why. Again, spicy psychology, you know? Yeah. And I know that pink is, like, is a really good color for, like, um, like first impressions and, um, like, pre being, like, presentable and, like, confident, essentially, in front of other people. So, it totally makes sense that she loves her pink. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then this year, so, um, in the fifth grade, the general outline as one of the historical sides of things, they learn about, like, 
uh, the Norse culture. And so we are already looking at like runes and the story, the actual story, not the Marvel stories of like Loki <laughs> and Thor and Odin and Sif. And um, she's getting really into that. So she might be going in that direction soon. And if she does, guess what? I'll have another book to read and try to consult with some of my more Norse pagan friends for like, okay, this is what she wants to do. How are we going to do this? So being able to do that's really, really important. Um, I also want to express that you know there are some kids who just do not get the woo woo so like my <laughs> oldest my oldest understands it's there and is abstaining from it she's like this doesn't feel comfortable to me i don't like the idea of religion things like that but maggie has no fucking earthly connection to that <laughs> whole concept okay like ooh ah magic she believes a fairy is just as real as her mama you know or like the wee folk are running around when she's in bed. That It's reality to her. It's not this huge mystical thing. It's very, in her black and white autistic brain, these are real creatures and these are real beings and they're, it's a, it's a thing. So instead of trying to make it seem, ooh, fancy, mystical, I really help her dig into the holidays and the, the big to-do with the changing of the season. So we make a big to-do of every equinox and every little thing. I don't necessarily follow the wheel of the year, per se, but, you know, spring, summer, winter, fall, we make a big deal about each one of those. And then our little traditions for each of these, like... That they'll have something special and she really wants to, to be on that. So if that feeds into a spirituality for her, awesome. I'm glad she finds it and grows there. But I I just let her pray with me when I have my candles lit and let her decorate how she gets excited. I, I explain to her, this is what we decorate and why, and she just runs with it. So let, let her have it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. No, that definitely makes sense. And I just, I, again, <laughs> I love so refreshing to see a parent respect the boundaries of their kids. <laughs> so, I didn't well, grow I mean, up in the most respectful household. So I'm like, I feel like this interview is healing my inner child. To, I'm being oh, that's nice. <laughs> honest. I'm being completely honest. Like it's like, so, you know, as a kid, I, I never wanted anyone to feel that way. So to see other kids that are, they, yeah, they have bad days. Every child does, but to see that they have a parent so accepting and like respectful of boundaries, like that's, that's healing to me. <laughs> I didn't have that either. And I feel like, you know what, these are tiny humans and tiny humans have like autonomy and they have, and with uh, Maggie's PDA profile, holy shit, I had to learn that autonomy can be very severe. Mm -hmm. So a gentle boundary where I could be flexible, she could not. So I had to really learn more respect on my end as a parent for respecting their boundaries not just being like yes you have boundaries you can say no you can say yes but like actually instead of trying to flex with them like i'll flex my boundary here for you to flex your boundary here so we can come to a compromise can't do that with her so i had to really as she got old you know as she got older i've had to really step up and commit to that respect and honoring that boundary and not trying to to push in any direction that she wasn't ready for or wanted to do. So she's actually helped me grow a lot, both spiritually and, you know, emotionally, because, you know, you think about all those people who are just like, oh, come on, just do this for me because it's this holiday. I can't, you know, I can't do that kind of thing. My, kid, my kids are just like, uh, no, I'm not comfortable with that. Uh, or, oh, no, this doesn't even seem interesting to me. And I could be like, please do it for mom. I just, <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to still do it. You can join me if you want to or not. But I respect that you don't want to. But I will still do this for me. This is something I want to do. And I'm hoping that that shows them that I can have a spirituality for me, something that is special to me and sacred to me, that nobody else has to share. But they are welcome to if they want you know, mm -hmm. uh, proselytizing and the missionary stuff when I was a kid in, in the church was, it, it altered my brain chemistry to the point now where I'm just like, well, if you don't want to do it, I'm not going to force you because holy crap, that's manipulative. Like I hated yeah. it then. I hated being the fishers of men. Oh, I hated it. <laughs> I hated it. So I'm not going to do that with my kids. Like, no, I'm good. Let them, let them want to do what they want to do in that aspect, you know? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And that's, that's a really good message. 
um and kind of like theme I, I like to think of things in theme oh no Andy it's a very good theme to have in parenting in general <laughs> it's and it's you know what it, it's taken me ages to figure it out but we can talk about that I can go off on a tangent on that a whole <laughs> other hour oh yeah understandable 100% <laughs> um and so do you have any advice for parents who want to raise their kids in a witchy or pagan tradition? So my biggest advice, especially if you yourself are in the broom closet, it would be, you know, don't force them into it. Let them see what you're doing. Introduce it very slowly, whether it's, you know, she's two and she doesn't understand why mom has all these pretty sparkly decorations, but I get to have my own too, you know, uh, with Miss Boo, she has a battery operated candle with our uh, autumn altar for the household and she loves to just pick it up and walk around with it. It's my tunnel. Absolutely. You have your own tunnel. That's <laughs> fine, but you can't touch my big fire candles so, though, you know, <laughs> but just let them see what you're doing. And, you know, keep that, keep that boundary of, yes, we can share this, but this is for me, whether it's an item, whether it's a candle, whether it's for safety, because you don't want them to get hurt, or if it's because you are either working on healing something or working through something, and you're not ready to share that with them, or, you know, things like that, keep the boundaries there. But if you're trying to teach them, let them watch you. Let them sit with you. Let them be part of it. If you are trying to teach mindfulness to a three-year-old, you are not going to get very far. But if they <laughs> see you doing it, they will slowly start to pick up on what you're doing. Being able to breathe, knowing uh, the things that you do to help keep yourself calm or go with the flow of things or why you do what you do for your own traditions. They pick up on that. And as they get older and find more of themselves and what they like and they don't like, you can help feed that. So even if you are uh, not a pagan, but they really want to look at, you know, looking at pagan aspects of things, absolutely. Let's pick up a book. Let's go find a good community and, and grow from there. If you are like, I am okay with kitchen witchy stuff because it's just part of what I do, but I cannot grow anything for crap, but I have <laughs> like my nine-year-old is suddenly like the greenest thumb in the county. Uh, I'm going to do the best I can and get her everything she needs to continue with her, her greedy herbal work, you know? Mm -hmm. And so just keep that, let them unfold to you what they're interested in don't shove it down you know don't be like oh my god finally you want to do witchy stuff here's all the things just like oh okay well what looks cool to you oh do you have any questions for me things like that and being able to meet them where they're at no matter what whether they're scared about it, whether they're uncertain because of, you know, friends or, you know, the media, you, they see witches as being bad, things like that. Meeting them where they're at and trying to be as honest to them as possible because they know when you're trying to bullshit them. So being as <laughs> honest as possible when you're doing things with them and when they see what you're doing, that's probably the best way you're going to teach them. Yeah, no, absolutely. I agree. Uh, you know, kids are way smarter than we give them credit for. <laughs> and so that that is a very good thing to point out. Like they they know, like you said, when, when you're bullshitting them, like they know. So, oh, yeah. yeah, you know, instead of doing that, you know, you can be, you can be honest and open, but age appropriate way, I guess is the way it's yeah. wording. Like you said, at where they at, don't throw big fancy words at them. Uh, like, autumnal equinox like they're, they're not going to understand that you know yeah you know make it age appropriate in a way where they'll they'll understand it a bit more so that's definitely makes sense and that is a great advice to give <laughs> and also don't you know even if you don't do anything my other my other big point is even if you don't do anything on the exact day who said it has to be the exact day you can celebrate and do rituals and things like that around the general time the vibe is still there the intention is still there now that's not to say please do your uh llama stuff in yule 
that doesn't quite <laughs> suit what the season is. But, you know, we just had Mabin and the autumnal equinox. That's a big thing for our house. So mm. when we redo all the decorations in our house and everything like that. And that takes us a week, both between what can I do for my executive dysfunction, what my kids are able to do as well. And we've got um, the equinox and the uh, and, and Michaelmas <clears throat> kind of tied in there for this year, at least. And it's we take that time. We don't try to rush it all into one day because that would be exhausting. So it, it's OK if you don't get it all done in the one day. Give it another day. Give it a week. Give it two weeks. Give it the whole damn season. Whatever is going to be easiest for y'all to experience and enjoy it is what's going to be what's important. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Uh, and uh, what advice do you have for parents who want to homeschool their kids or already homeschool their kids? The number one thing I tell everyone is to research your state's laws. There are some places that even though they say you can homeschool, you have to be in like a, a co-op pod or a, uh, private school umbrella school kind of thing the laws are weird make sure you know your laws but no oh, let me get some water homeschooling is one of the biggest sacrifices that i have ever ever made in both my personal space and my time we live in a very rural area a very christian oriented era area and um there were, <clears throat> there's not many things in the, out here within an hour's drive that I could consider doing as any kind of homeschooling group that isn't church oriented. Not saying that church can be bad, but <clears throat> for those of you still deconstructing or having that issue with religion, um, it, it can be. It can completely wreck you no matter how good you want it to be for your kids. If you can't manage your energy in one of those settings there's no sense in going you know mm -hmm. um there were even a bunch of groups out here and all over the country that i saw that were requiring like pledges of faith before you could join their co-ops and their their homeschooling groups and i was like what the fuck <laughs> 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 but um unless you've got like those really really big like uh, you're closer to a city that has a bigger pagan or witchy like circle it's gonna feel like you're doing this alone it's gonna feel like you can't do it and as you get more and more disconnected it's gonna be like what is the point of this i'm doing this all on my own so i would also say even if you don't have somebody there you know get out in your community and in some way shape or form whether it's the library near you or um if you've got a ymca if you can afford it they do have some membership options and some class options for low income but it's not always sustainable or attainable um <clears throat> your farmers markets your there are times that like the senior center has like open areas where they can all kind of mingle together uh, uh, <clears throat> pardon me at least out here they have those moments and so we do things like that um just going out to the park even and just being around just being like hey how are you having your kids out and about in the real world is more socializing than that 30 minutes they get on the playground mm -hmm. you know so don't don't be afraid to be out in the community even if it's not in a co-op per se you know or a homeschooling group it's okay it's okay knowing how to act and knowing how to communicate whether verbally or non-verbally with people of all ages and creeds and genders is important and will help them grow more than just uh, constant competition with uh, <laughs> same age children. Um, I also want to say that even though all these things, at times I'm just like, why am I still doing this? Holy crap, I need a break. What is this? What was I thinking? When I see how my kids have been able to grow and I'm there in the trenches and seeing every step of the way. It is the most beautiful thing. The little things that I picked up on. Seeing how they react. Hello, my darling. I just had one come and give me a hug. Hi, Maggie. <laughs> Hi, baby. Um, 
seeing what I missed with my oldest because I had to work so much for so long. Um, I can see it now in my three youngest. I would not have been able to connect with them how I am now with them being gone for eight to 10 hours a day. You know, I, I have to see it from that perspective when I get tired. You know, I it's not a, I don't have to do this. I get to do this. It's a privilege. No, no, no. Because then there's times when it's still exhausting. But yeah. <clears throat> I feel like I get to see them in a way I never would have seen them otherwise. Even on the days that I'm going crazy, you know. Um, and then my last one, I'm going to say, you do not have to spend eight bajillion dollars to do that. <laughs> you don't have to do every single community activity. You do not have to do every single, you know, extracurricular activity or project or, and you don't have to do all of it. It can get expensive really, really fast. I would say to look at what you have locally, what can you do online? Check out free stuff because free stuff is good. Don't ever Google anything with homeschool. Look at like practice or ideas or things like that. Never actually Google homeschool. You'll always get something paid. <laughs> um, and then be ready for things to be messy in the best way. Whether it's because you haven't been home all day because you guys decided to make an impromptu field trip and to go out, you know, for a walk in the woods or because you guys were doing a big project or because it was a day that everything was going wrong. So you just let it all go wrong and collapsed on the couch together to reconnect. It's okay. Just, it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be expensive. You don't need a separate space. You don't need, it can be all over the house at any time of day, any day of the week, any season, at, along with your, your laws, your state laws, but <clears throat> you can do it. You, it doesn't have to be Pinterest perfect and it doesn't have to follow anything crazy so long as your state laws say it doesn't have to follow anything crazy. I think in Wisconsin we have to <clears throat> have 180 recorded school days and we have very relaxed laws otherwise and I'm like I can do 180 days that's absolutely easy let's go. She has a meltdown one day guess what I still count that as half a day. We did three things today. We win. You know, it. what's the difference between an early day for school or a snow day or a bad weather day or, you know, something like that where they have to go home early? What, what's the difference between that and having a, a meltdown or a bad sensory day so we don't do any school? There's no difference in my head, you know? Oh, definitely. Yeah. That's you know, like you said, yeah, as long as you're following the laws. <laughs> yeah and of you know you tweak things as you go along you learn that's good that's really good at least there um it definitely I feel like would take a lot of the pressure off of parents because I feel like parents especially those who haven't homeschooled before and who are about to for the first time they put a lot of pressure on themselves I'm sure you did for the first bit um especially because you said you started during COVID right so that that was extra pressure there Right. I pulled everybody home in COVID. We did little things like in holidays and weekends, we would do little projects, but full time was in COVID. And my, my partner was not on board with homeschooling until he saw how miserable the kids were with how it had to be crammed in with the public school. And he goes, she doesn't even like, she doesn't like any of it. Why are we doing this? And I'm like, thank you. Let's do something <laughs> different. So oh, that's great. No, yeah, for sure. Having that support must have helped a lot too. So oh, I, 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 yeah, I feel like I would add to find some support. Like if you're a single parent, you know, you could find friends or, or family members support. And then if you have a, a spouse or a partner, you know, turn to them for support as well, because it could be really emotionally like overwhelming for yourself and you, you do have to still take care of yourself. You oh know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and it's, it's, you can, like I said, you can do it at any time of day. So if you're working a first shift job while the kiddo is at, you know, grandma's house or at daycare or something like that, do like an activity or something like that. When you guys get home, I know you're exhausted, bake it into, make it work into whatever you're doing together, whether it's you're reading a story and asking them those critical thinking questions, or like if they're older, they can do some, you know, student led stuff and then come back together at the end of the day or anything like that. It, 
you can make it work. You can make it work in just about anything, even if you feel like it, you can't. If this is something you're really passionate about and you feel really drawn to doing the homeschooling and you're ready for this sacrifice, you are <laughs> ready for this huge upheaval and change for you as an adult, uh, then absolutely, there you will find ways to make it work. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and yeah, those are all the questions I had. But did you have anything you wanted to add before we sign off for the day? Yes. <laughs> Okay. If you feel like you can't do it, if you feel like it's too much trying to teach your kids the witchy stuff, if you feel like you're not ready for them to see that aspect of you, if you feel like you're going to get blamed and bantered because you have super religious family or anything like that, it's okay. You don't have to. If they have an interest in it, you can tell them to have some discretion. The same goes for homeschooling. If you have zero support and everybody is beating down on you all the time, maybe try the homeschooling like through virtual schools. Um, maybe try like like actual online schools, like the, the schools that are actually online where you see all the kids and you see their faces and stuff like that. Look into some programs that do that and see if you guys can work with that. If you feel like you can't do it and it's your mental health, that it's your mental health that's going to shreds and you literally for putting your kids in a different program, whether it's the virtual school, sending them back to public school or private school, whatever. You're not a failure. You're not a failure. If they don't teach, if they don't learn how to be witchy or anything like that from you, you're not a failure. This is something that you have to do just as much for yourself as for them. So make sure that you're okay first. Reach it. Yeah. That is a, really good message to end off on <laughs> I know I mean I literally like breathed out like I don't have kids myself and I exhaled like so I had to turn away from the microphone to exhale deeply because like that was so like the weight came off of me like I don't even know why I don't have kids I'm not homeschooling or nothing <laughs> That's a there, and comforting message. <laughs> there's so much pressure that we put on ourselves for every little thing all the time and if you can't do it you're not a failure you know, I did a lot of lactation counseling, peer-to-peer -peer lactation counseling back six, seven years ago. And that was the biggest thing when they were just like, I can't do this. I can't do this. And while the program was, you know, breast is best, I said, fed is best. Let mama rest, period. <laughs> so that that carries with me in just about every aspect. If you really feel like you can't handle it mentally, you're not a failure for that. Good job for trying. Good job for reaching your kid and meeting them where they're at. But they need a parent, they need a mom, they need a dad, they need a guardian, they need somebody who is there for them and not constantly burnt out because they're trying to put everything on a plate for them. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Was that everything? That was everything. That this was time, everything. that was everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just wanted to be sure because... Like you said, I I don't like I don't want to interrupt. And like you said, like this a lot. It's a big topic that could be longer than one episode for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So thank you again for coming on. It really means a lot to me. Um, again, I will link all of your social media stuff, uh, podcast and blog below. Just send me those links so that I have them to put in the caption. Um, and then, yeah, I think that is everything, right? <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I, I really appreciate it. I hope that it helps somebody. That's all that matters. If it helps one person, I've done my job for the year. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Absolutely. All right. Um, and so thank you all for listening. Um, blessed be. Have a wonderful day, week, month, and year.